If you're from Britain, you might recognise these natural specimens on the ground here, and you might know why I've put them in this video. Even if you're not from Britain, you might recognise that they're some kind of chestnut. These are horse chestnuts, or conkers. They're completely inedible, shiny, woody nuts that grow in early autumn. Children used to play a game where they drilled holes through them, put them on a string and whacked them against each other. Whoever's conker broke lost the game. This is all very recent stuff compared to the early medieval period. But there's this folk idea that conkers scare away spiders. That if you put conkers around the corners of your house, spiders will avoid them. For a long time, this was something where different people had different ideas about how true it was. Some people thought it was just an old wives' tale, others thought that it probably was true. In 2018, one study showed that at least three species of spider do tend to avoid chestnuts. In my experience, a lot of people don't put conkers around the house just to deter large nests of spiders that will hatch and invade. They put them around to deter any spiders, because to many of us, spiders are repulsive, scary things. Not everyone feels that way, of course, but it's a common enough fear and a specific enough fear that a decent bit of research has gone into it. So what did people in early medieval England think of spiders? There are a few words for spider in Old English that we have recorded. Among others, spidra, atorkope and junta. Although I think it's pretty obvious which one of these has survived best today, let's talk them through like I did in the COVID, uh, the COVID sorry, video. In Middle English they'd be something like spidra, atorkope and junta. In Modern English, spider or spider, atorkope and hunt, although if we're going analogous to the Old English word it would be hunter because the Old English word means thing that hunts. These words all still have some presence in modern English or immediately pre-modern English. Spider is obviously the normal word for this animal across dialects today. We think of some spiders as hunting spiders, although that may have been sort of reintroduced as a biological classification rather than being a survival of the Old English word. And the word atacop is recorded at least recently, if not still used today, in various dialects, including my favourite traditional dialect, Cumbrian. And I think Tolkien also makes use of it. As for the spider versus spider thing, this is a common kind of alternation where the the sound sometimes hardens to d between vowels. This is also why you see old texts say murder rather than murder. And you do see spellings in pre-modern but post-old English suggesting spider. So in Old English, what was the difference between these words? Was it just that they meant the same thing in different dialects, or were they all used in the same dialect but with different shades of meaning? There is something like 660 species of spider nowadays in the UK, some of which you'll see far more often than others, and they all have different behaviour, they all have different environmental niches that they fit into. The two that pop up most often in my life both live indoors, um, they're the very delicate cellar spiders, which live pretty much everywhere in the world in a variety of similar looking species, and giant house spiders, which are anywhere from quite small to about the size of the palm of your hand. They move in a very quick, jerky way, um, and I've shed a lot of my fear of spiders as I've grown up, but this one I still have a very visceral fear reaction to. Having said that, they're not really dangerous to humans at all. You have tiny money spiders which you sometimes find on you, and jumping spiders which jump ridiculous distances, and outdoors you have all manner of small hunting spiders, and here are a few shots I managed to get of the exodus after my sister cut the grass. Uh, this orb weaver spent a long time detaching all of the detritus from its web. Clearly there are lots of ways you could divide up the semantic spider space. I sometimes use the examples in Bosworth and Toller's Old to Modern English Dictionary to get some sense of the meaning of words, or at least a starting point. The example under Junta and Spidra is from an Old English medical text, the Lache Bork, and it promises in its contents page, Lache domas withon yif junta ye bite mannan, that swide, odre naman gangel wevra sex durende kraftas. Roughly, remedies against if a junta should bite a person, that stronger, other names Gangel Wevra, six useful recipes. Weirdly hard to interpret. The translations I've seen expand it to against if a junta should bite a person, that is the stronger kind of junta. They are also called Gangel Wevra. So do we find any more information if we look at the actual recipes? Well, these seem to make it a fair bit clearer 
that different terms may mean different types of spider. So if a junta bites you, you're meant to cut three scars in your skin coming out from the bite, catch the blood in a spoon of green hazel wood, fresh hazel wood, and throw the blood over the road, over the path, and nothing bad will come of the blood. And then make a scar on the wound, pound up a plant called leechwort, and put it on the scar, and no harm will come to the person. If a gongelwavra, notice the variant spelling there, bites you, you're supposed to take the lower part of a plant called averde, and lichen from a blackthorn bush, a slow bush, dry it until it's dust, reintroduce moisture with honey, and then put that on the wound. And it gives another recipe against the bite of a junta, fried black snails ground into dust, pepper and betony, and have the person eat some of the dust and put the rest on the wound, and then yet another one about scarring and throwing the blood over the path and using um, plants, although different plants in this case. So maybe junta and gangelwevra are two different things, two different types of spider. For what it's worth, wevra means weaver, and the, the root gang usually means something like to walk or to go. So this might be something like a walking weaver. Either bit of the word could apply to all manner of spider species. If you're from the UK, you might already have noticed one of the weirder things about these remedies, that they exist at all. Britain has no spiders that pose any serious risk to humans unless you're unlucky enough to have an allergic reaction to them. You might expect several different remedies for spider bites in a country where there are more venomous spiders, or at least spiders with venom that can harm humans, but here it's pretty much just allergic reactions. When allergic reactions do happen, they can be very serious, so this could be preempting allergic reactions. On the other hand, it could be that these are translations of remedies from another country where spiders are dangerous. Or a third option is that maybe there were venomous spiders in England back then. The archaeological record does not preserve small invertebrates very well. Obviously there are freak paleontological accidents like spiders being preserved in amber from millions of years ago, but in the UK there really aren't many circumstances in which a spider's body would be preserved from the early medieval period at all. There are some spiders in Europe that are a bit more problematic. The Mediterranean black widow can deliver a painful bite and I think it can very occasionally be fatal. So is it possible that one of these more dangerous spiders might have existed in the UK and since gone extinct? Maybe, maybe not. You wouldn't have to be that observant to realise that spiders are predatory. If you go back to an orb weaver's web every so often, in my experience it will have prey in there more than once a day. I went out at night once and found this one with what must have been a crane fly in its web, quite a large insect. Um, I mean, I think they live pretty much everywhere, so I'm sure we all know what they look like when they're not in a web, but um, yeah, they'll catch things pretty regularly. Um, you, you'd only have to glance at them every so often to realise that they were predators. Um, incidentally, one thing that surprises people when they first learn about it is that cellar spiders, the fragile ones, pretty routinely kill and eat larger house spiders. Um, here are two cellar spiders having a little interaction, which I guessed was one trying to get in on the other's kill, but I don't know if that's true or not. But early medieval remedies go beyond just the more obvious damage spiders can do with their bites. There's been a lot of discussion about one of the Anglo-Saxon metrical charms, with dwerg, against a dwarf. Without going into much detail about what it is for someone to have a dwarf, um, the charm involves writing seven names on communion wafers and then singing this story into the patient's left ear, their right ear and above their head and then have a woman, possibly a virgin, hang something around his neck, uh, maybe the wafers. And the spell goes in modern English except for key words which I'll leave in old English. Here came incoming an inspiden creature. He had his covering, maybe his harness, in hand. Said that you were his horse laid his reins on your neck, then they began to ride off from the land. As soon as they'd come off the land, then there something began to cool. Hines has limbs, but I don't, I don't know where that's from in the manuscript. Then came incoming the creature's sister, and she ended it and swore oaths that this illness should never afflict this, maybe that means the person it's afflicting, or the one that's able to obtain this incantation, or the one that's able to recite this incantation, Amen. So the crux here is the word inspiden. There are researchers who have read this as inspiderwicht rather than inspidenwicht. In that case it could mean that the creature came in spider form. S um, 
Spider, spider could easily be a variant of spidra. I can't find any clear explanation as to what the word in spiden might mean, if that, that is what it is. It may just mean again in the form of a spider, but that's on its own, I think that's a bit of a wishful extrapolation if the rest of the spell doesn't say anything that specifically brings the spider to mind. There's no scientific way of interpreting things like this, but what I would say is this word dwerg is used a lot to describe the instigator of many illnesses, and it's definitely the word that became dwarf in modern English and is cognate with the Old Norse word dverger, which more obviously means some kind of person-like folkloric creature. Maybe not with all the exact characteristics of a Tolkienian dwarf, but um, with a lot of those characteristics. Some have argued that early medieval English people thought dwarves were responsible for illness. Others have argued that dwarf may have just come to mean something like fever, and these remedies might be straightforwardly talking about an illness in a modern sense. I'd say that that begs the question of how this word, which clearly originally meant dwarf in the folkloric sense, ended up meaning illness. I'd say at least there's, there's likely to have been some connection at some point between the folkloric ideas of dwarves and illness, especially as we see elves also being blamed for illness, and that's another term that widely refers to some folkloric creature across Germanic languages. So putting that on hold for a moment, Reading this and knowing it's referring to the cause of some illness, I'm struck by how much it sounds like a tick getting on someone and riding them around. Probably most people know, but for anyone who doesn't, a tick is a parasitic invertebrate that lives in grass, especially in fields with grazing animals. Um, they'll usually attach themselves to animals and suck their blood, and they can just as easily go on humans and do the same thing. I've had a tick before on myself that got fairly engorged. It was, I think it was pushing half the size of my little fingernail before I noticed it. Luckily, I don't seem to have developed Lyme disease. Um, but as, you know, as I say, ticks can transmit all sorts of diseases, many of which present as a fever. It's not just Lyme disease, there's all sorts of things they can carry. Um, ticks are arachnids, they have eight legs, they look superficially like spiders. So maybe inspiden does mean something like spider-like or in spider form. Uh, and this spidra term just includes ticks as well. There's no reason to think that Old English speakers would make a taxonomic distinction between ticks and the 700 or so species of proper spider by modern standards. And maybe this could account in part for why you have a term like gangelwevra to disambiguate the walking, web-weaving type of spider from the tick type of spider, but maybe that's a bit of a reach. The words reveal a certain amount about Old English or pre-Old English attitudes to these animals. Artur koppe is a compound of artur, meaning poison, and koppe, meaning something like cup or container. If this did mean poison cup, it may well have just been seen as one lexeme in its own right, in the same way that you'd be wrong to assume modern English speakers think a butterfly is a fly that likes butter. You know, it might be over-extrapolating to think that Old English speakers viewed spiders as inherently poisonous or not poisonous. Although maybe they did, um, it's certainly interesting that they understood that when a spider bites something, an actual substance passes from the spider into the victim's body. Um, and yeah, this, this Artur Koppe is related to various Scandinavian words meaning spider in, in the modern North Germanic languages. Spidra comes from a West Germanic word meaning thing that spins, and the reason it's spidra rather than something like spintra is because of the Anglo-Frisian nasal spirant law. If you have a vowel, then a nasal consonant like n, then a fricative like th or the, the nasal disappears and the vowel lengthens. In a roundabout way, this is related to German spinner, which means spider, so maybe unsurprisingly the web spinning behaviour was obvious to early medieval people and their predecessors. We have other angles we can look at this from. I mentioned that the archaeological record doesn't preserve invertebrates very well, but there are situations in which it can preserve them. A Historic England report on invertebrates in Northern English archaeology laid out some of those circumstances. In general, waterlogged deposits, bits of ground which have been saturated with water since the archaeological record was deposited, are good at preserving organic material. Organic material that's charred or burnt also sometimes survives because no microorganisms want to eat it once it's been charred, but it still might maintain its structure from when it was alive. Obviously, even though charred insects won't decompose in the normal way, they're very delicate and susceptible to being destroyed in other ways. The review comprehensively goes through insect remains, and unsurprisingly, most of them are from anoxic waterlogged deposits and are creatures you'd expect to find in waterlogged deposits 
beetles, fleas, nematode worms, a surprising number of honeybees which were exploited by early medieval people as livestock but not necessarily a watery animal, but no spiders mentioned, um, house spiders and cellar spiders tend to live in drier places. In the mid-2000s a study was done in the reconstructed early medieval village of West Stowe, um, a load of um, reconstructed buildings exist there and it's used as a kind of experimental archaeology site as well as a tourist attraction. Researchers left several pitfall traps in the reconstructed houses, containers in holes with a saline solution in them to catch, kill and preserve invertebrates that wandered in. This has the drawback of obviously being in modern Britain, but the significant advantage of preserving basically anything that walks around on the ground and is small enough to fall in is not just things that would normally go near water. All of these traps contain spiders, although the authors unfortunately don't go into detail about which species. A bit frustrating from the perspective of this video, but understandable because I know these journals have word limits. And they were mainly focusing on beetles to compare them to the actual archaeological deposits I mentioned earlier, to see how much the Westo deposits looked like the actual archaeological deposits. Quite a lot as it turned out. When I started making this video, I was interested in whether a deeply ingrained fear of spiders was a cross-cultural universal, and whether it applied in early medieval England. My hunch would be that somebody in that environment would probably have been exposed to spiders a lot more, both indoors and outdoors, and might be a lot less scared of them. The older members of my family who'd grown up in agricultural environments didn't and don't seem to be outwardly scared of spiders at all but I actually found a dissertation on pretty much that exact subject written by Megan Cavell in 2018. A lot of references to spiders are Old English translations of Bible verses where spiders are seen as fragile. Things are said to waste away like a spider, or in another translation, waste away like a spider's web. In texts composed by Old English speakers, albeit written in Latin, this idea of fragility is reflected. Bede's text on the life of St Cuthbert comments that with God helping, somebody can pass through the enemy's snares like a spider's web, implying that a spider's web is viewed as very delicate and unable to stop somebody walking through. The Old English Handbook for a Confessor, probably written in the 900s or early 1000s, lists spiders, using a different term, lobbun, um, as a punishment alongside things like prison darkness and mutilation of limbs. Now it could be that lobbe had a secondary meaning of a type of torture instrument, but Cavell points out that in other texts, like one in the Peterborough Chronicle, there are lists of things like adders and toads uh, that are used to punish people. There's also a reference in the handbook uh, to the confessor drawing out sins like poison from a wound, which sort of harks back to some of the medical texts about spiders. So it, it's it's very possible that lobber here means spider and that a spider might be used as, you know, a load of spiders might be used as a punishment. But another instance of translations being open to interpretation. A homily from the Old English Vercelli book describes churches which will be destroyed, the altars abandoned, and spiders' webs developing within. So here they're being associated with the neglect of a building, so when humans go, the spiders' webs show up. There are lots of instances of Old English writers adapting biblical psalms into Old English verse, and it's in these that the cultural attitudes of the writers come through, because they're taking the biblical text and interpreting it in their own language, changing the wording, rather than just doing a close translation. And one of these psalm translations reads, Waran an likas dure winter yonge wivran, son ne hiu yornast bith, fateo a fare fleuran on nette. Our winters are most like a spider when it's most eager that it should scare flies into its net. So Cavell picks up on the word arfare, the infinitive form would be arfaran, and this pretty robustly means something like frighten. So the image of something that's not just passively catching flies but scaring them into its web. And this is not in line with modern understanding of how spiders behave, at least as far as I know. Um, spiders, especially common web weaving ones like orb weavers, passively wait for flies to come into their webs and then go and get them. Which isn't to say that early medieval people weren't very observant or couldn't be picking up on something I'm not aware of, but it seems like here the idea of them scaring flies into the web may be partly an extrapolation from some general idea of them being scary or malevolent. Cavell also points out that the word net is often associated with hunting nets, 
in, in Old English literature and not often used to describe spiders' webs. So it may be metaphorical here, casting the spider as a sort of agent that actively ensnares and kills things. As you get into the Middle English period, you get to more references uh, to spiders as disgusting or malevolent things, although that's now outside the scope of this video, but I'd encourage you to go and read that dissertation. It's still not completely clear why, in modern Britain and presumably some other countries as well, fear of spiders is so much more common than a fear of something like beetles. The more recent papers I found put it down to a combination of genetic and cultural factors. Um, famously, researchers in the early 70s suggested that people are predisposed to being scared of spiders and snakes because a lot of human evolution happened in a place where spiders and snakes were dangerous. But attitudes to spiders during early medieval England do read as being fairly negative, especially the references that are more likely to reflect real early medieval attitudes rather than just being inherited from something in the Bible. But as, as you can tell whenever I translate one of these passages, there is so much interpretation in, in trying to work out what, what, what was going through the author's mind when they wrote a certain passage. So it's, yeah, it's all up in the air, sorry. Hopefully this exploration has been interesting anyway. Um, thank you very much for watching this spidery and terrifying autumn video, and I, I hope everyone is getting on all right.